This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Yuat. It's Thursday, September 3rd. This is Africa 54. Due to the global outbreak of COVID-19, Voice of America is taking every necessary precaution to safeguard its employees. So our broadcast will look a little different today and in the near future, as we, out of an abundance of caution, reduce our staffing at VO headquarters here in Washington. We're working to help keep you informed about what's going on and we appreciate your staying with us on Africa 54. Tanzania is heading toward October elections after five years under President John Magufuli. Magufuli has initiated major infrastructure projects and fought against official corruption, but critics call him the bulldozer for ignoring criticism of the projects and cracking down on opponents and freedom of the press. Charles Combe reports from Dar es Salaam. Like 16% of rural Tanzanians, 87-year-old Zaina Mohammed has lived without power for 30 years. But she hopes the Rufiji hydropower project will change that by making electricity cheap enough for her to afford. When the electricity project is completed, I will not have to use a kerosene lamp anymore. Things will be better, as I'll have electricity. One of President Johnny Magufuli's mega projects the dam is expected to be finished in 2022 and provide 2,100 megawatts of electricity, tripling Tanzania's hydropower. We believe that when completed, many citizens will stop using firewood and charcoal. Instead, they'll be using electricity that will be available at a cheap price. But the construction is taking place in the Seleuze Game Reserve, a wildlife protection area the size of Switzerland. Conservationists say as with most of Magufuli's mega projects, the hydropower will come at a cost. The ecosystem of the Seleuze Game Reserve is specifically for the wildlife. So the introduction of the hydroelectricity plant at the Seleuze Game Reserve tend to uh, some species which were supposed to be, or which, was, which used to be available in that area, are going to be lost. The president's supporters note his projects, such as the Standard Gold Railway to link neighboring Rwanda and Uganda, will help boost the economy. Magufuli earned the nickname The Bulldozer for his road projects and later for his actions to reduce spending and corruption. But critics say he's also intolerant of opponents and cracking down on a free press. I have experienced being questioned many times by authorities, arrested, held by police and also taken to prison. I have been charged with various things since 2016. I have been taken to court more than 148 times. Tanzania's opposition party for democracy and progress, Chadema, chose Tundulisu, who returned from self-imposed exile in July to challenge Magufuli in October's presidential election. An outspoken Magufuli critic, Lisu left the country in 2017 after a known gunman shot him 16 times. During these five years, we have experienced against the Constitution, against the law, political parties prohibited to perform their activities. That is the first blow against democracy because democracy includes people's freedom of expression. And to have many political parties, alternative parties that can give out alternative ideas. At the August launch of his re-election campaign, Magufuli touted transforming Tanzania from a low-income country to a middle-income one. While his critics see darkness washing over some freedoms, Magufuli's supporters look to economic development for a brighter future. Charles Kombe for VOA News, Dar es Salaam. The leader of the rebel group Sudan Liberation Movement, which was not part of the negotiations in Juba that led to a peace deal on Monday, is calling the agreement nothing more than a plan to distribute wealth and government positions and asserting that it does not address the underlying reasons for Sudan's conflicts. SLM leader Abdel Wahid Al-Nur told VOA South Sudan in Focus radio program on Wednesday from Paris that the agreement reached in Juba will not achieve lasting peace in Sudan. He says the SLM is rejecting that peace accord because it's business as usual and it's the same as the Abuja agreement and many others proposed deals. 
Anu says Sudan's conflicts have resulted from the monopoly of power by certain elites in Khartoum and the marginalization of people from other areas based on their ethnicity and religion. The United Nations says record flooding in Sudan is damaging infrastructure and contaminating crucial water supplies amid the coronavirus pandemic. David Doyle reports. Record floods in Sudan have devastated infrastructure, the United Nations has warned, cutting off humanitarian access and preventing people from taking measures to protect against COVID-19. Dozens have died and thousands of homes have been destroyed after heavy rains triggered severe flooding and a rise of the River Nile by up to nearly 17.5 metres, the highest level in 100 years according to Sudanese authorities. Around 125,000 of those affected are refugees and internally displaced people, Shabi Amantu of the UN's refugee agency said on Tuesday. Roads have become too muddy for traffic to pass, making it extremely difficult or impossible to deliver humanitarian aid to some communities. According to the UN, around 2,000 water sources, vital amid the coronavirus pandemic, have been contaminated or are non-functional. Hygiene and sanitary levels have plummeted due to flooded latrines and contaminated water supplies, preventing people from exercising necessary COVID prevention measures such as regular hand washing. The UN said 37,000 homes have been destroyed and another 39,000 damaged, and that the government has declared a state of emergency in Khartoum, where more than 21,000 people have been affected. David Doyle of Reuters with that report. The Zimbabwe High Court has granted bail to jailed journalist Hopewell Chinono and Jacob Garibume, leader of the Transform Zimbabwe movement. The two men had been behind bars since July 20th. The government accuses them of inciting violence on Twitter ahead of a planned July 31st protest against poor governance in Zimbabwe. Lawyer Beatrice Mtetwa says Chinono's bail comes with harsh conditions including surrendering his passport to the court, the title deed to his property. He must also report to the court twice a week and promise not to tweet anything that has to do with protests. European Union members could purchase potential COVID-19 vaccines through a plan co-led by the World Health Organization. Joe Davis has the details. EU member states could buy potential COVID-19 vaccines through a procurement scheme co-led by the World Health Organization in what appears to be a change in position by the EU Commission. The move could allow EU governments to secure vaccines from companies which aren't negotiating with Brussels, including American firms. That would represent a change of policy, as the EU executive originally advised member states not to purchase vaccines through the World Health Organization scheme. It previously described the scheme as slow, expensive and legally incompatible with the parallel EU procurement programme. The apparent change comes after the World Health Organisation last month softened the terms for rich countries to join its scheme, which aims to secure two billion doses for the most vulnerable people in the world. It also follows criticism of the EU that it was effectively undermining the World Health Organisation initiative. That's despite projecting itself as a champion of multilateralism and a supporter of equitable access to vaccines for all. By forcing EU states to buy only through an EU scheme, the Commission was actually at risk of reducing the amount of doses initially available to less developed countries. That's because it would be prioritising EU citizens, effectively replicating the nationalist policies of the US. The EU has so far reached an advanced purchase deal on COVID-19 vaccines with AstraZeneca. It's also in talks with others such as Johnson & Johnson and Moderna. That was Joe Davis of Reuters reporting. The number of COVID-19 infections is rising in Spain, one of the early epicentres of the pandemic. In this report narrated by Jonathan Speer, Alfonso Beto has more from Barcelona on the dilemmas the country faces as it prepares to reopen schools. As the pandemic accelerates throughout Europe, Spain is once again especially hard hit. Masks are still mandatory, bars and restaurants are operating at only 50% capacity. Gatherings of more than 10 people are banned. Those measures remain the authorities' safest bet in a war that does not appear to be ending. We remain on alert. This is not good, especially in some regions, and it must be stopped. COVID-19 tests are being conducted in areas where the virus is most prevalent. In some areas of Barcelona, residents between 18 and 40 years of age are asked to take the test but others are encouraged to do it as well, just to be sure. 
I saw that they were doing the test and said, well, let me do it. What happens is that I am older than the age required, but let me do it just the same. Spain, like Italy and France, was hit hard in March, but the resurgence here has been worse. Some blame lax enforcement of social distancing rules and other issues. There is no doubt that socializing has played a role here, but other factors, such as less than efficient contact tracing, may have also contributed to this. Schools are set to reopen soon, and experts are offering some reassurances as families, teachers and students express concern. In this pediatric hospital, researchers are studying the virus's behavior at summer camps. What we have found is there is little infection by children. Only about 4 to 5 percent of their contacts end up being infected. And this represents a very low infection rate of only 0.3 percent. By comparison, doctors say the average infected adult spreads the virus to up to three people. Spain shut down schools in March, even before it cancelled sporting events. Now, the priority is to get children back into the classroom, even while the ban on large gatherings remains in place. For Alfonso Beato in Barcelona, I'm John Spear, VOA News. College towns across the United States are eager to see students return to classes and help local businesses recover from the coronavirus pandemic. But as Maria Madiello reports, Local business owners are also worried there will be a surge in new cases. When the pandemic sent many of Michigan University's 40,000 plus students back home earlier this year, the college town's small business district felt it big time. It was like a three foot blizzard without snow. So, you know, nobody walking on the sidewalks, nobody going up and down the streets. The fall term begins in September with at least some in-person classes on campus. That's bringing both hope and anxiety to businesses which rely on the students to stay afloat. Adam Lowenstein is a bar owner. I'm glad to see the students coming back. Like the, the first probably emotion is um, relief, you know, happiness. Justin Herrick owns a restaurant. My gut feel is people are going to come back, there's going to be a significant outbreak, and it's either going to be uh, managed um, and contained, and, or you know they're, they're going to put a, hit the pause button and go all online. And I think my gut feel is probably the latter. Jeff Saunders, the owner of a piercing parlor, says he's fought hard to keep his business going. So the pandemic's really thrown a lot at us uh, and you have to really run your business extraordinarily well uh, to succeed. Not all places are back up and running. Espresso Royal Coffee, the once successful shop, is not coming back due to the pandemic according to its website. Former customers like this Michigan U student are disappointed. Yeah, it kind of sucks that those places are, are not opening up, especially Espresso Royale. There's a lot of people in my house that like that. Perry Perico sits in the street outside one of his businesses in a makeshift patio area that didn't exist before the COVID-19 pandemic. Despite troubles, he remains optimistic. I'm hoping and praying and uh, uh, I believe that we're going to be okay. We're going to be okay. Small business owners eager to see students and normalcy again. Maria Madiello, VOA News. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, more about Melania Trump, the first lady of the United States, and Jill Biden, the wife of Democratic presidential candidate, Joe Biden. We'll be right back.
Hello, I'm Lynn Ormoudou, your VOA Health Correspondent. During the COVID-19 pandemic, the World Health Organization says there are currently no drugs licensed for the treatment or prevention of COVID-19. And there is no proof that hydroxychloroquine or any other drug can cure or prevent coronavirus. The misuse of hydroxychloroquine can cause serious side effects, illness, and even lead to death. For more information on COVID-19, visit who.int or contact your local or national health authorities. In U.S. politics, it's commonplace to hear about red states and blue states. In red states, the majority votes for Republican Party candidates. In blue states, most vote for Democrats. U.S. television networks get credit for the shades of meaning. As color TV gained popularity in the 1960s and 1970s, networks started using color-coded maps to show election night results. At first, there was no consensus on which color would represent which political party. But during coverage of the 2000 presidential election, most networks used blue for Democratic states and red for Republican. People then started using red state and blue state as political figures of speech. Purple states, also called swing states, are a blend of red and blue. They're so evenly divided, they could tip toward either party. Welcome back to Africa 54. Melania Trump, the first lady of the United States, was a model before she married Donald Trump 15 years ago. She's also a Slovenian immigrant and an opponent of cyberbullying, standing alongside a president who has disparaged immigrants and regularly attacked perceived adversaries on Twitter. Viewers Caroline Prasuti shares with us things you might not know about the president's wife. Stand up, Melania. First Lady Melania Trump, always poised and stunningly dressed. An immigrant who grew up in Slovenia, a former Yugoslav Republic of two million, where her childhood friends still live. She was very positive. She liked reading books. She also liked designing. She would make new clothes out of old ones. That love of clothes led to her first job as a model which eventually brought her to the United States. She's the first immigrant to be First Lady since Louisa, who was the wife of John Quincy Adams in the 19th century. Melania and Donald, 24 years her senior, met at a party and married in 2005. Barron Trump was born the next year, now the youngest presidential son in the White House since John F. Kennedy Jr. in 1963. She's an incredible mother. She loves her son, Baron, so much. He's enjoying his school and his sports. He's a great athlete. And I just want to have him um, out of the spotlight for now. Melania herself shies away from the public eye, except for occasional appearances on behalf of her causes. Her Be Best campaign promotes child welfare. In July, she distributed lunches at a shelter for single mothers. Be Best also discourages bullying on social media. Today's technology provides people with the digital shields to hide behind. She has not weighed in publicly on her husband's tweets, which often savage opponents. When he mocked teenage climate activist Greta Thunberg, her office issued a statement saying, it is no secret that the president and first lady often communicate differently, as most married couples do. At times, she herself has been a target. When President Trump won the election, the Slovenians built a statue in her honor, dressed in her inauguration suit. But on July 4th of this year, Independence Day in America, vandals set it on fire and it was removed. It is a daunting task. It's easier for first ladies of states who have played a similar role in a state uh, but uh, for someone who has never even been in government before, this is a tough job. Let us pray. 
Melania Trump is Catholic, the first Catholic First Lady since Jacqueline Kennedy. She is America's only First Lady to speak five languages. It is my honor and great pleasure to stand here before you as the First Lady of the United States. Even though she spent the last four years mostly away from the cameras, experts say Melania Trump will now speak out more as she pushes to be the First Lady for another term. I'm so impressed by how thoughtful you have been with your report. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Washington. Jill Biden, the wife of Democratic presidential nominee Joe Biden, is on leave from her job as a college professor to assist with her husband's campaign. Mrs. Biden is very familiar with life in Washington since her husband spent 36 years in the Senate and eight years as vice president under Barack Obama. Here again is VOA's Caroline Prasuti with more interesting facts about Jill Biden in this profile. It's been Joe's faith that really has gotten him. This is Jill Biden these days. And that's exactly what my husband Joe is going to do. Holding virtual campaign rallies for her husband. This one to a group of Latinas. A day later, Zooming at a community college. Hi, Erin. A forum near to her heart. I'm Jill Biden, and I'm honored to be a community college professor. Jill Biden became the first ever second lady to hold a paying job outside the White House while her husband was vice president. Many of my students don't know that I have two jobs. At her college's commencement, she told the story of a student who ran into her classroom saying, Dr. B, I saw you last night on the television with Michelle Obama. And I called my mother and I said, Mom, Mom, there's my English teacher. And she said, that's not your English teacher, that's the second lady. If Joe Biden is elected, Jill Biden would be the first presidential spouse to have earned a doctorate. Betty Boyd Caroli wrote the book, First Ladies. I would expect her to be very active in suggesting specific reforms to the education system. The way I, but not everybody agrees. You know, many people would like a first lady who keeps her mouth shut and is seen only in the very best clothes. I'm not in that school. I really think it's a powerful platform. Life with Joe Biden started out complicated. She was going through a divorce. He was grieving, raising two young sons alone after his wife and baby died in a car crash. Jill and Joe married after Joe asked five times. And the fifth time, I finally said to her, I said, Jill, I, my Irish pride has gotten hold of me. It's the last time I'm going to ask you. I said, you don't have to tell me when you'll marry me, just if you'll marry me. <laughs> she said, yes. And four years later, Jill gave birth to a daughter tragedy would strike again in 2015 as Joe Biden's son Bo died of brain cancer. This is personal for me and for my husband Joe. So Jill Biden added cancer initiatives to her list of causes. So should we read? Sure. In June of this year, Joe Biden wrote a children's book. Not only did he lose his fear of public speaking. About her husband's early years, his competitiveness and resilience after being mocked over his stutter. Mrs. Biden displayed that protective streak during a March campaign rally. Watch how she uses her body to block a protester from reaching her husband. Not once, but twice. Although they call the tiny state of Delaware their home, Jill Biden has followed Joe through his last 21 years as a U.S. Senator on Capitol Hill and eight years in the White House where she'd like to return for at least four more. Buenas tardes, comadres. Carolyn Prasuti, VOA News, Washington. <laughs> Masks, sanitizers, and the most shocking of all, no crowds. After six months of closure and strict lockdown, New York City museums are finally reopening. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, MoMA, and Whitney Museum, among others, are welcoming visitors again but with a few COVID-19 related restrictions in place. Nina Vishneva has this story narrated by Anna Rice. It's two hours before the Metropolitan Museum of Art finally opens its doors after almost six months of closure. But painter Steven Galizinski is already in place. 
The artist has dreamed of being the first one to enter when the museum reopens. Uh, the first thing I'm going to see is Joan of Arc. St. Joan of Arc is the painting, uh, my favorite painting in the Met, so I'm going to go there and then I'll take a look around. I have my sketch pad in my backpack. Typically, six million people visit the museum each year. Before the pandemic hit the U.S., tourists made up about 40% of the Met's visitors. But on this day, the line to get in consisted mostly of New Yorkers. During the pandemic, I would come to the other side of the outside of the Met and look inside at the sculpture hall because I just miss the Met so much. So I'm really happy that it's open now. Nothing cultural. Um, all the movies were at home. Everything was at home. So I'm just really excited to be out and be able to do something that's different, which should be normal. So. The Mets director, Max Holine, greeted the first post-pandemic visitors and offered to take a picture with them. The museum had big plans to celebrate its 150th anniversary in 2020, but Holine says the focus has shifted. But right now, uh, I would say uh, our moment is we don't want to celebrate. I think we want to provide our services, especially to the New Yorkers, and we want to be part of New York coming back to a level of normalcy and uh, creating an environment that New Yorkers love and expect. The museum has lost $150 million since mid-March and laid off about 20% of its staff. Officials say they hope to return to normal as revenues increase again. In the meantime, visitors now have to schedule visits, check their temperature and wear face masks. Guests toured a new exhibition called Making of the Met. It's a journey through the museum's 150-year history, with over 250 works of art on display. For many New Yorkers, the reopening is a sign that life is returning to normal. I followed the rules. I never came out. I stayed at home. I cleaned my house. I took care of all of my business. And this is the opening of life the way it had been known for me. Local food vendors are also heading back to work. Without the mat, for some, there was no work. We didn't expect it to, to just stop, you know what I mean? And we tried to open a couple of days after that, and there was absolutely nobody here. You know, this, this is a destination. And if the destination is closed, so it was a long five months. No work, you know. The black and white banners at the entrance are done by Yoko Ono and read Dream Together, the reflection of the power of art. For Nina Vishnyova in New York, NRI's VOA News. That's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thank you for watching.